Return to Heaven 2.0, Heaven. Basics number 407. This is the twelfth lesson, and I have a title for it, as you see in your bulletin, Inheriting All Things. Inheriting All Things. What does that mean? Well, let me get into the New Testament, out of the Old Testament, where I was for a little while. Revelation chapter 21, if you would please. Revelation chapter 21. I think we go all gaga, goo goo sometimes when we think about heaven, and that's that's kind of to be expected. Um, we think of, you know, I don't know, county fair, or I don't know what your vision is of what heaven is, or what it has been. Uh, temples, or light 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 shaded beings or dark shaded beings or the bubbling of the creek or something like that what kind of image goes through your mind because everybody especially for a young christian in the lord has all kinds of images of what heaven is like and what to expect but there's a lot of doors in heaven there are a lot of rooms in heaven there are a lot of spaces in the universe uh, that you have no ability to make to make it right now because you couldn't breathe outside of our atmosphere. It's hard enough when you get to a high altitude. Even a carburetor has to be adjusted uh, to uh, to operate in Denver than it does here. Everything is different. The oxygen's thinner on the mountain, and uh, it's cooler, and it's one thing, but. When you don't have a, a body that will be confined to the biosphere that we are confined to as carbon-based people, uh, the imagination can run wild from you playing golf on Mars to uh, what have you, because you're not going to be affected by time, nor space, nor distance, or the biological infrastructure that you're used to, though you will be all who you are. When Jesus Christ, after He was resurrected, He walked right through walls, but yet He looked like He had a fleshly body. He wasn't confined to the atomic structure of this world. But you will have an atomic structure to your being, and you will have a soul and a spirit that will be a lively inside of that perfect body one day as a Christian. And then there's the place that you will go. But there's also the positions that you will have. And that is not based upon you being good enough to get to heaven. That's all based on who Jesus Christ is. That's based on what you thought of Christ while you were here in time on earth, as it is for me. And that's the reality that Marty was speaking of a little while ago. So many are so unaware of it that as I put in my Facebook post this morning, that God is not a socialist. He doesn't believe in the equal distribution of that. There is a basic citizenship for all born-again believers. Basic citizenship. These are the basics that you get. And there will be wonderful things that are eternal basics. But there are also places where you will be able to have access based upon your performance as a believer in time where some may not have access, or privilege and position where some may not have that privilege and position because they spent most of their life in the spiritual brig. By grace there, by grace saved, and as it says in 1 Corinthians, yet so as by fire. If my life as a Christian was more of hay, wood, and stubble, temporary things that do not last, as opposed to gold, silver, and precious stone, which comes from the Word of God, that makes a true virtuous believer out of me. That's what's important. Not popularity, but virtue. That's what we need. So I entitled this lesson, Inheriting All Things. Could have put a question mark there. Now, I'm not saying that I will. I don't believe that I will. But let's see what it means as we look at it this morning. In Revelation. 
chapter 21, verse 4, And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Write these words, for these words are true and faithful. And he said unto me, It is done. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely. And he that overcometh shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. But the fearful, the unbeliever, the abominable, the murder, the fornicator, the sorcerer, the idolater, this is habitual lifestyle, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death, which is eternal separation from God. Heavenly Father, we ask you help us to understand your word, that it might encourage us and also instill within us a reverence for you that we need. A reverence that has seemed to have escaped society today. Help us to maintain that reverence for you and for each other. Thank you for what you do for us. Thank you for our families for the measure of security that you have given us, for the measure of health that you have blessed us with. We pray for those that are sick. We ask your mercy upon them. Thank you for their health care helpers. Thank you for our military and our police force that helps in a godly way to try to maintain order when things can blow up so quickly. We ask, Father, for your wisdom to be imparted even if by divine fiat upon the leaders of this nation, that they are forced to have to use the law for what the law is for, even when they spew against it and speak against it now, that you will force their hand to have to use law in order to keep from completely destroying themselves. Help us, Heavenly Father, to realize that you only care for what's best for us. Help us to trust that narrative as seen from your word. And thank you now for this day and for this grace that we have to be here. In Christ's name, amen. Well, let me get into this just a little bit this morning. Because when we talk about inheriting things, we like to inherit good things. There's something that we got from, from Adam in the Garden of Eden that we inherited that none of us like, and that's the old nature to rebel and to want to compare ourselves to God with our human good. Uh, That's something that we inherited in the old sin nature uh, that is still a part of us even when we become Christians. There is still a tendency for us to want to have our way. That's why when some people are said to have been born again, saved, accepted Christ as Savior, people are shocked when they do something that is just out of the norm for a Christian. And some people might say, well, how in the world could a Christian do a thing like that? Because they still have a sin nature and they still have free will. It's just that simple. God doesn't make a robot out of you when you accept Christ as Savior. He allows you yet to be a free will, a free moral agent who has the right and the choice to choose between right and wrong. And bear the consequences, be they good or bad, as a result. Thus, the verse of Scripture in Galatians that we have in our bulletin this morning, God is not mocked whatsoever a person sows, that shall they also reap, whether you're a Christian or not. But in Romans chapter 6, I want us to look at something here. I've got a few words I want to say, but the greatest functional victory won by Christ for us, which we should be claiming each day, is victory over the influence of sin in our lives. He has given us victory over the influence of sin in our lives. We cannot deny the presence of sin tempting us, but we can deny sin's influence over us. Romans 6, verse 16, verse 14, we start, For sin shall not have dominion over you. Yes, it has effects on us sometimes. We'll say something we shouldn't say, do, or dwell on something that we shouldn't. But sin shall not have constant dominion. That's the 
passage here. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law. Now, the word thee is not in the original text. He's not referring to the law of Moses. He's referring to the law of the old sin nature. That's what the whole seventh chapter is going to talk about. But you are not under the law of the old sin nature, but you are under grace. What then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law, but under grace? Forbid. Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are whom ye obey, whether a sin unto death. Again, context there has to do with the sin nature, not the law of Moses. That's why he's saying, he said, you either can make yourself a servant of sin or a servant of righteousness. But God be thanked that whereas you were the servants of sin, the old law of the body that ruled your life, you have, you have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine or teaching which was delivered unto you. Being then made free from sin, you became the servants of righteousness. And that spells not only functional victory in your daily life, regardless of who you are and what you do, but it also guarantees that you are storing, you have stores of blessing in heaven that the Lord is going to bestow upon you when the day comes. And it will be a part of your heaven experience. And I want to put that in there, that it is going to be a part of your heaven experience. You're thinking, it's the same size potato in every pot in heaven, isn't it? Well, it might be the same size potato, but it's not going to be the same size position all for everyone. And I want us to understand that. And some people might say, well, Pastor, you're, you're dividing the family of God. Well, God knows if you are going to be a loser or a winner as a Christian. It's your choice. You can be a loser or you can be a winner. You say, I'm a Christian. How can I be a loser? Well, be like Demas as Paul's fellow servant was. He left Paul because he says he loved this present world more than he loved the Lord and the service of God. Victory over sin is impossible if a believer will not subject themselves to the ministry of the Word of God and submit themselves to the discipline of God to grow in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ. That's just the way it is. And a lot of believers don't want to accept that there are consequences for how they live now. I'm saved, it doesn't matter how I live now. There are consequences to how we live now. There are consequences to what we do. You're saying, I might not go to heaven? Absolutely not. Then what's the problem? You're not bringing any glory to God with your life. So how's that going to affect me? Will it stop me? No, it won't stop you from getting to heaven. But you're going to see your rewards that you could have had go up in a great big bonfire at the Bema Seat of Christ. Do you want to see that happen? Because there are things that you may receive that you will not get because you do not qualify for it. My job as the pastor is not to pat you on the head, but to prepare you to meet your Maker. And too many pastors are spending their wheels, spinning their wheels, trying to entertain their churches rather than preparing them for eternity. So we have to be grown-ups in the group. We have, there has to be a grown-up in the room. There has to be grown-up churches in the body of Christ. This is not romper room church. We're going to stand before our judge. And some people want to make Jesus out to be some sort of a 1968-69 hippie. They're smoking a big doobie when you get there. I'm sorry, that's not the way it's going to go. It's not going to roll a big fat one that says, oh no, here comes John, we're going to need two of those. I know I might be a bit facetious. But what I'm trying to get the point is that there's a reality that we're facing that I think that we have cast in the light that is that is is more of a reality show that we're going to be involved in, and it's not going to be a reality show. Or we let some religious biases that we might have had in the past 
somehow or another make Jesus a plastic Savior. We're not ten soldiers. We're beings with free will. <laughs> think he's going to look like Bob Marley and he talks like he's just lit one up. Uh, no, don't think so. Not that I would know. I'm just saying. The victory over our sin is impossible. And you're not going to receive many, if any, rewards if you don't have victory over sin because you made it your Lord. You coveted whatever it is that it drew you to. And we have to get the word in there to displace that desire. Getting saved does not get rid of the desire to, to, to do things that you shouldn't do. Getting saved doesn't get away the desire for people to want illicit relationships. It doesn't get rid of the desire to covet things that you, you know, where you would steal it or, or be dishonest to get it. Or to tie one on, as the old saying goes. That's still in that burning in that old nature of us. And so we can make it right. By the power of God, we can make it right. We're not a write-off. We're all damaged goods here. But God doesn't write us off. And that's where I think it's great. That's why we can have a relaxed mental attitude. We're at all different levels of growth here. We can't be afraid to know that. And in some churches, the preacher would never say that because he would be afraid for his people to acknowledge that. As a Christian, our main objective is to walk in God's power and not our own. And if you do that, everything else God wants from you will come to pass. But if you do not, your life will be filled with hay, wood, and stubble. A life of useless good works done under the influence of human good, not by the power of the Spirit of God. And there's a lot of good human, there's a lot of human good that's going on. There you say, well, pastor, what's wrong with human good? I mean, that should be a good thing. The, pro the concept of human good is that under the concept of human good, it is a comparison to divine righteousness and it is in done such the old sin nature uses human good as a person's justification for their self-righteousness or their righteous level of righteousness. I've done this. You'll ask somebody, well, I've done this, I've done this. So they're comparing their human good that they've done, their good deeds, with the righteousness of the cross. That's the problem with human good. Is that it sets itself up as a comparison to divine good. When you're doing something for the Lord as a Christian and you're doing it under in fellowship with the Lord, it's divine good because it's done by the power of God for the glory of God. And you don't throw your shoulder out of whack trying to pat yourself on the back over it. You might pat somebody else, but you won't be trying to pat yourself on the back for it. A lot of human good does. That's why they got awards for it. There's no awards in heaven for human good. We'll just throw that out there free of charge. But in Revelation 21, verse 7, as we were at last time, it says, He that overcometh shall inherit all things. Let's get to it. Again, that's a present tense. It's a participle. Overcometh. The present tense reveals a pattern of life marked by consistently getting the victory over our own flesh and daily life because it's in the present tense. It's not in the aorist or the perfect tense of a completed action, pastime, or a continuous action that is found to be definite, as the aorist is. It is seen in the present tense, and it talks about something here. He that overcometh shall inherit all things. Now, if you go back to Revelation chapter 2 and, verse, and chapter 3, you will see the seven churches there that Jesus addressed. And my take on this passage, because it is a little bit conflated, there's a ton of different interpretations of this passage. Trying to get the right interpretation sometimes is difficult, especially when there are passages or books of the Bible that will carry a subject out to a certain point, such as the book of Revelation does, and then back up and punt and re-explain something a little bit more chronologically further down the line as far as the layout of the book goes. And so this is a back up and punt, verses 7 to 8, or a backup and punt passage. Because now he goes back to his present day 
And he talks about those seven churches that those believers, every one of the seven churches, every one of those, there is a passage of promise that uses the term overcometh with it. Every one of them has a passage of promise that says, well, if you'll do this to straighten out the church at Ephesus, the church at Smyrna, the church at Philadelphia, which was a good church, the church at Thyatira, the church at Laodicea, all these other different churches, if you'll do this, then if you, then you will overcome for this blessing or this reward. And so this is the back up and punt, verses 7 and 8 verses are. Because he's not talking about once you get to heaven that you've got to overcome something. It's not talking about, you know, the group that is in verse 8, which are those who consistently are living a life of sin, of a habitual lifestyle of the unsaved. What he's talking about here is that the believer needs to be presently getting the victory over their passions and their mental attitude toward others, and also victory over their mouth. That is what we say makes it, it, it counts. And our Lord is speaking to those, I believe, in John's day, as the present tense is used in verses 7 and 8, not future tense. What we believe in how we live now, in other words, has eternal consequences. We may not think about it now when we think about the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, talking to us at the end of time, as it says here in verse 6. Because we know there's the, there's the rapture of the church, there's the, the beam of seat judgment of Christ while we are in the heavens and our rewards are given based upon our faithfulness in time, and then the second coming of Christ, and then there's the thousand year reign of Christ upon the earth, and then there's the end of time and the atomic fission of the planets and the earth, and then the new heaven and the new earth after the great white throne judgment of all the unsaved. But he's taken into consideration what is your life like now? What we believe and how we live now has consequences. Even if we have already got our name in the Lamb's Book of Life and we're going to heaven. Not that we'll lose it. That's not the point. But we can lose reward. That's what 1 Corinthians 3 talks about. For the believer, it says in James chapter 1 and verse 12 that there is a crown of life to those who highly esteem the Lord. There is a crown of life. And this will be rewarded for those who overcome. Now, James uh, chapter 1 and verse 12 says, Blessed is the man that endures temptation, for when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life which the Lord has promised to them that love him. And the word love used in that passage is agape, who shows unconditional love to the Lord, who reveres the worth of the Lord by enduring the temptation of the old nature, whether it's a temptation to thoughts that are sinful, words or passions that are sinful. This is a great reward given in heaven for those who are willing to do that. This is a great reward for containing your virtue as a Christian. Now, God can forgive us if we lose our virtue as a Christian, but he expects us to maintain that going forward, that virtue. Okay? Forgiveness is wonderful. Forgiveness is forgiveness, okay? But God eventually will make us to bear the consequences. You're not going to get away from this world without some consequences. And we're not going to get away from our accountability to the Lord without there being some consequences. That's what that whole judgment seat of thing is about, is is to bring to bear everything that needs to be brought to bear. No secrets. He'll uncover every rock and stone, turn it over, only no secrets. And it'll just be between you and the Lord. It's not going to be like it's going to be broadcast on Facebook or something. We'll need that craziness then anyway. It won't be broadcast because it's just going to be between you and the Lord. Okay? It's going to be between me and the Lord. I'm so grateful for that. Because Jesus honors the believer's priesthood, your private walk with him. But your reward, whatever that might be, it will be carried, it will be displayed openly forever. Not only will it be displayed during the thousand year reign of Christ, 
but it will also be displayed in the eternal state. It's just a short time of being a good girl or a good boy. Just a short time. As a Christian, I'm talking about not doing a, being a goody little Lord Fauntleroy or something like that, thinking that that's going to get you, you know, some points with God. That's not the way it works. But as a Christian, the ramifications, I'm telling you, and just take it to heart, that for a thousand years of being with the Lord in the millennium, being used by His service in any way He sees fit, with still at the same time having access to the heavenly city Jerusalem, that's your pad, and you being able to get from here to there in a split second because you're not confined to the physical elements that you're confined to now. And there will still be a world going on here. There will still be a work going on here on this earth during Christ's kingdom age, which was promised in oodles of Old Testament passages as well as the Gospels. That some people just completely just dismiss and allegorize rather than look at it as a literal interpretation. I don't understand why some people think that God would give the literal amount of years that Christ would reign, the literal amount of time that the tribulation would happen, the literal amount of Jews that would be sealed during the tribulation period of 12,000 from the 12 tribes. The literal amount of days of burying the bodies after the second coming of Christ. But yet it not being a literal kingdom makes absolutely no sense at all. You would have to call God a blatant, bald-faced liar to say that it's not true. And I do take offense to that. And I think you do too. Because we're on His side. We have that fighting spirit. Paul speaks of a crown of righteousness in 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 8 as a reward given to believers who fight the good fight, who finish the course and keep the faith. You know that passage. And Paul says it is these who love Christ before and loved Him at His appearing who receive this crown. And they loved Christ at His appearing. And that's in the perfect tense, which means they loved Christ prior to whenever they died or prior to ever seeing the Lord in person. And this means that you are a Christian who keeps a positive attitude towards the things of God and you you keep an unconditional devotion to Christ as Paul did have. You didn't have. You don't live the life that he lived. You and I don't live the circumstances in which he lived. But we live with the same challenge, and that is self-will versus divine will. That hasn't changed a bit. That hasn't changed since the Garden of Eden. Self-will versus God's will. But the believer who gets a crown of righteousness, and we just talked about a, a crown of life. This is a crown of righteousness. I'll remind you that these crowns, as many of you re- remember from former studies, is that the crown was given as nothing more than uh, uh, like it was like a holly or some sort of a garland, uh, and uh, but the garland would be given, and the person would wear it on their head as a crown of victory in the Olympic Games or sometimes in military campaigns. And when the victor would come back into the town, he didn't come in through the normal gate. They would cut a hole in the wall because he deserved a special place to mark his entrance. Because he was a victor. And then they would put his name over that door. Over that place in the wall. And then they would build a monument to this person in the town square. Then they would put this person on a horse. And they would lead him around the town in great attire. Then they would give this person a home for the rest of their life for them and their family. Then this person would not have to pay taxes for the rest of their life. This person's children would all go to schools and colleges and universities in that day because they were the offspring of such a victor. So there were a lot more ramifications or there is a lot more that's attached to the crowns than just wearing a piece of head jewelry that you would eventually cast at the feet of our Savior when that day comes. That crown represents remunerations that are eternal and are, are, are thick with wealth and joy and privilege. 
Not everybody's going to qualify because the qualifications are given here. Not everybody's going to get a crown, but there are crowns. And the crown represents something. It represents effort. It represents you putting your best virtuous foot forward. It represents you being a, an ambassador for Jesus Christ. That's what it represents. You are an overcomer. And there's proof for that. And there's reward for that. And a lot of believers don't understand this. It's good that we understand that the Bible is very clear about this. And good times and bad times, as well as prosperity, as well as persecution, you just remain faithful. You're a faithful believer. You're not perfect. You have to confess your sins like everyone else does. But you don't let it get you down. You keep going. And you try not to make the same mistake more than a half a dozen times anyway. But back to Revelation 21 and verse 7, the Lord is referring to the believer that we are more than a positional overcomer in Christ. We can become a functional overcomer. This participle is not in the aorist or perfect tense demonstrating a future inheritance based on something that had already been completed, such as our completeness of being in Christ or saved. God is talking about how we live our lives in the present tense. As I said, Revelation chapter 2 and 3, when our Lord addresses the seven churches of Asia Minor, each one of them given a reward if they should overcome certain challenges. The question is, as it was then, as it is now, as it will be then in that day when we answer, did we bow our will to God? Not just when we got saved, but do we bow in daily sanctification, which is true worship. And something I don't want us to get conflated or confused here, there is the church age now, there's the rapture of the church, there's the seven-year tribulation period, there's the second coming of Christ at the end, and there is the millennial kingdom of Christ for a thousand literal years. But during the time when you're in the third heavens with the Lord and you're receiving your reward at the judgment seat of Christ for your works, that's what they're for, is for your works for rewards. Then he glorifies your resurrected body and you will have a way of showing the citations that you received at the judgment seat of Christ because they represent that Jesus was worth that much to you when you were living in time. You see military, they have the ribbons, citations, different things. I don't know what it will be like, but the illustration is given through the Apostle Paul and through others in the New Testament. That great reward will be demonstrated upon the attire of the one who has earned the Congressional Medal of Honor, the Silver Star, the Bronze Star commendations, whatever that might be. It is honor to whom honor is due. That's the way the Lord works. And we need to understand it in the concept that He is a real person, but that is God. And that He values your devotion to Him greater than anything in the world. And He will take care of you. He's given you the moxie, the understanding of how to conduct your life. He's given you the road map for how to do it. And He's promised you a reward at the end if you'll just follow His orders. Paul was so sure that he was going to get the crown of righteousness that he put it in the indicative mood because he had done everything God had told him to do. And God does not welch on His promises. If God promises you something, you're going to get it. God's not going to say, you're the wrong race to get this reward. We're not rewarding your race right now. Oh, we're rewarding another race. God doesn't see color. God's not a bigot. Black, white, red, or yellow. God doesn't see color. I imagine He sees red sometimes. It doesn't make any difference what nationality or race you come from. It is equal opportunity to honor the Lord Jesus Christ as a born-again Christian. And that's the, really the only kind of Christian there is. True Christian. You're not a follower of Christ if you're not saved.
So, we can become that functional overcomer by living in Christ and for Christ. Did we bow our will to that of our Lord? God said that he that overcomes shall inherit all things. Here we get a little further along. We shall inherit all things. I entitled our message this morning, Inheriting All Things. This is a third person future active indicative verb from the Greek word kleronomos in the original language. And you say, well, why does he bring that stuff out? Because the Holy Ghost spoke it in the Word of God. I've had preachers or I've had people even, I've even had preachers say, why do you bother? And my question is, Emily, why don't you? The Holy Spirit picked a specific language because He wants you to know what in the heck is going on and what's going to happen. He that overcomes shall inherit all things. Indicative mood means no element of doubt. We, that's why we can trust that the Spirit of God is telling us these things. We have taught on several occasions regarding a believer's eternal inheritance, inheriting all things, that positionally we all have opportunity to receive a great heavenly inheritance and all will receive much. Now, don't let me let that pass you by, though. All will receive much. But our position in Christ alone does not qualify us for personal reward. It merely positions us for personal reward. And all the rewards that you get at the judgment seat of Christ that carry over through the thousand year reign of Christ and into eternity. Because remember, once you die, you can't earn anything after you die. You will have had to have earned that right before you die. You don't get to come back like some of these movies are. And do a good deed among humanity and then get sucked back up like that movie Michael and that crazy stuff with John Travolta and all that mess. You're not going to turn into an angel anyway. When people die, they don't turn into angels. I might as well turn into a dog or a cat. Angels are different beings. I'd probably be a manatee. A sea cow is another word, isn't it? But our position in Christ alone does not qualify us for a personal reward. It merely positions us for rewards, for rewards outside of the general. And there are general glories of heaven. There's general glories of going to Disneyland. But you've got to have a ticket for certain parts of the rides, I guess, and different things there. I've been to the Buchanan Festival. I know that's a whole lot closer to it. The closest thing to Disneyland I ever get is the Fireman's Festival in Buchanan. But you get to get you I mean I'm looking around and it's great. I can go to the hot dog stand but I got to pay for it. I can go here but I got to pay for it. I want to ride the ride I got to go to the place and get the little ticket, you know. You know why you got to buy a ticket at the stand, don't you? Cuz they don't trust that the person that is running this thing that won't be there in the next 2 3 days won't but just pocket the money and say, "Well, I only had two on that ride." Or whoever owns it. No, they have to have a control. They have to have, you know, control of what's going on for sure, for safety and everything else. But there's the general glories of heaven that's described in this second half of this chapter. Being faithful to the Lord is shown to be greatly rewarded in heaven as you are shown your devotion to Christ during the days of your life. But there are some things that are not, some are not privileged to. What? There's some doors that your negative volition in time closed for all eternity. You reap what you sow. I hope we understand that this is, this is a wake-up call for us in our faithfulness. And I'm not saying you're not faithful. I'm not just talking about attendance. I'm talking about in our personal lives. Is that there are things that God wants you to have that... According to 1 Corinthians, if you believe in the authority of the Word of God, 1 Corinthians chapter 3 says every... This is talking about believers when it says every man's work should be made manifest. That is, our motivation for our works will be made manifest. For the day shall declare it, that is, the judgment of Christ, because it shall be revealed by fire, another term for the purity of the Word, 
Puros is used there. And the fire shall test every believer's work of what sort it is. If your work abides, that is, is not consumed by false motives, and God's word will reveal that, then you shall receive a reward. That's why it says in Galatians 6, 9, not to be weary in well-doing. But if your work shall be burned, that is, you did it with the wrong motivation, well, it will su- you will suffer loss. But you Im- yourself shall be saved, yet as by fire. Uh, 2 Corinthians, I think it's chapter uh, 5 and verse 10 says, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, talk to, about, about Christians, that everyone may receive the things done in their body according to that they've done, whether it is good or bad. Not whether or not if it's enough bad, you're going to get booted out of heaven because you're going to be there as an eternal guest and a child of God forever. That's not that's never going to happen. That's not the issue. The issue is what did you think of Christ in time? Because the more he glorifies himself through your life in time, the more your rewards will be piled up at the judgment seat of Christ. And they are a reflection of him and what he meant, to, what he means to you. I don't know if I can make that any simpler. The Lord wants to reward your faithfulness because every time He does, it honors His Father. And He wants to do it openly for all time. To be unfaithful now would mean loss of reward in heaven. I did not say loss of salvation because that's secured by God when you believe in Christ. Salvation is by grace and nothing more. But rewards are always based on faithfulness in time. We are to be faithful in every aspect of our lives. This faithfulness in all things is a form of worship seven days a week. When I don't do what I'm tempted to do that might be wrong during the week, that's, an, that's a fact of bowing my knees to God. That's worship. When I'm ready to run my mouth and say something to somebody that I feel like they got coming to them and I'm ready to let her rip, and but yet it's not right, and I keep my silence, that honors the Lord, and it is recorded, and I will, will be rewarded one day for it, as will you. It's not about how many works that you have. Some of you are gifted more than others in certain areas and are have a different platform to tell others about the Lord because of the business you're in or whatever it is the outreach you might have, it might be part to do with your personality that it's easy for you to speak or talk to others. For some of you, it's hard for you to do that. That's not a failure or a mistake or something of that nature. It's not a fault. You're just different. God uses you in different ways. But what is your heart like? I can be a big mouth and have a bad heart. You can be quiet and have a bad heart. You can be quiet and have a good heart. I can be a big mouth and have a good heart. Too many Christians are satisfied to just be positioned in the body of Christ and they just want a little cabin on Walden's Pond where they could just kind of, like Emerson, hide away back in the woods. Too many Christians are satisfied just to be positioned in Christ, but they, for whatever reason are disobedient and being faithful to Christ. Their purpose in life is themselves, not the Lord. If you are not in Christ, it will be hard for you to have a purpose in the Lord because you need greater than just, you know, positive thinking to get you there. You need power of God on the inside. You need an infusion by the Spirit of God to make that work. Our purpose is to glorify God by being conformed to Christ, Romans 8, 29. That's the primary purpose of God for the believer, to be conformed to the image of Christ, Romans chapter 8 and verse 29. It is said there that it is foreordained that the believer be conformed to the image of Christ. Before eternity In eternity past, before the worlds were ever formed in the mind of God, God knew that he would make creatures in his image who would be given the opportunity to reflect his glory during their life. And that glory seen through reflecting who Christ and his character is, is as close as we're going to get to being like God. 
So it takes a steady intake of Bible instruction, including what you learn in your church and under the teaching ministry, the one God calls to help you to reach maturity. That's, that's important to reach that maturity. Ephesians chapter 4. And we'll quickly close up here. Ephesians chapter 4. It's important for us to understand these things. I mean not to get ahead of myself. And hopefully you not to get ahead of me. We've had members in this church before. They were already thinking ahead what I was going to say. And then after church, I didn't say it. They'll say, well, do you know, you know what about the, what about the, what about the? I said, was that your sermon or mine? You can preach yours some other time. And I'll give you the opportunity if you want. <laughs> and they may be 100% right, but it's not the point I was trying to get across. I remember as a member of this church for years as a former pastor and myself being called to the ministry and I hear him on a subject and I, he had a vein of thought that was going into where God was leading him and I had a vein of thought that God was leading me to think along uh, some other long, some other line and my notes didn't look nothing like what he said because they were starting to come out of my thought about the subject matter and I missed the sermon. <laughs> because God had him speaking to perhaps somebody in that church that needed to hear that and maybe that wasn't for me that Sunday, so I guess I'd get it some other time. But Ephesians 4.12 says, for the, he gave, verse 11, and he gave some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers. Actually, that's pastor teachers. For the equipping or perfecting of the saints for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. The building up, and the word edifying refers to a spiritual house, not numbers. Not large parking lots, not large edifices, but a building up of the body of Christ, spiritually speaking. For what purpose? Till we Look at verse 13. Till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God. The word knowledge is spiritual knowledge. It's epinosis, prefix, preposition, E-P-I, worth the word knowledge as the suffix, till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the spiritual knowledge that's gone from your head to your heart where it's in your conscience. God wants the pastors to drill the Word of God into you, at least offer it to you on on a consistent basis so that it becomes your conscience, that God's Word becomes your conscience. Not the preacher or His Word, but the Word of God becomes your conscience. Because until then, your conviction is still toward you. And as John said, John the Baptist said, He must increase and I must decrease. That's not going to happen without the Word. The band is not going to make that happen. Till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a teleos, a mature man, an oak tree from an acorn, unto a mature man or woman, anthropoi, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every cray-cray of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness by which they lie in wait to deceive. I went by the Universalist Church the other day in Roanoke next to Patrick Henry High School. And they had two great big flags stuck out of the side of that. I went over to visit where my son's house was to make sure everything was okay and everything was fine. But he owns a home over in that area. And I went by there Friday and lunchtime and I thought well, let me check it out make sure everything's alright yeah everything's fine but I went by this church and they had great big flags in the front yard one's all black and it's got three letters on it and the other one is very colorful got stuff written on it and that's all I'm going to say but there was no Christian thought to that it was just that that was the wind of doctrine that's going through the culture right now there may be some merit to what some people say, but the truth of the matter is that is a place where only Jesus Christ reigns supreme. That's what that's supposed to be for. But people are so distracted today with social justice that they forget they need to take some time away just to let God speak to them instead of them constantly talking to God. That we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine, whatever shifting through cultures, by the 
the, the craftiness, the slight of men, and the cunning craftiness, the way they form their words, in which they lie in wait to deceive. But we speak the truth in love that you may grow up unto him in all things, who is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplies according to effectual working and the measure of every part, making increase of the body unto what? The edifying of itself in agape virtue, love. That's what we need to see there. And so the, the word of God is needed. And God has a plan in getting it out there. And Isaiah chapter 53 and verse 12. I'll just give you these verses. You don't have to turn to all, all of them. But Isaiah 53 and verse 12, I'm talking about qualifying for reward. Isaiah, Isaiah 53 and verse 12, after it talks about Christ was, was bore our griefs. He carried our sorrows. We did esteem him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. He was wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him and with his stripes we are healed. But it goes on down in verse 12 and says, Therefore will I divide him a portion with the strong, with the great. And he shall divide the spoil with the strong because he hath poured out his soul unto death. He will divide the spoil of the victories of Christ with the strong. He does not divide it with the weak. That is the insolent, selfish Christian. And this is referring to the day of rewards. You see, there is a tactical victory over the battle in the soul. And the believer who is positive to the things of God exploits God's logistical grace to stay in tune with the plan of God. Romans chapter 8 and verse 17, Paul said this, And if children then heirs, heirs of God, and join heirs with Christ, I don't know if you see that or not, Romans 8 and verse 17, if children then heirs, heirs of God, and join heirs with Christ, look at that follow up, join heirs with Christ, what? If so be that we suffer with Him, that's undeserved suffering. That's sacrificing our will to the will of God. That we may also be glorified together. Please see that passage and don't just pass it by real quick. Paul was going through undeserved suffering. He was being persecuted for living the Christian life the way he was supposed to and following the calling that God had given to him. Paul had already gotten past whether or not he was going to live for the flesh or he was going to live unto sin. Paul had already gotten past that. He was a mature Christian. If you haven't gotten past that, you're still not a mature Christian. But once you become a mature Christian, your sole focus is on whatever God wants you to do. And your question when God tells you to jump is not why, but how high. Have you come to that place in your Christian life? When God tells you to jump, you don't say, why? Why me? You say, uh, okay, why? Uh, where? What? What do you want me to do? <laughs> like Jojo the monkey boy. Throw me in, coach. You don't even have a helmet. Throw me in anyway. <laughs> Children, then heirs, heirs of God, and join heirs with Christ. If so be that we suffer with Him, that we may also be glorified together. Not talking about getting to heaven here now. That's not the point. You're a born-again Christian. That's not the issue. The issue is that you want to be glorified together. Glorified means that He shares His glory in you in a specific manner that reflects His image in you and for specific service. Romans eight twenty-eight and 29. He says, and we know that all things will work together for good to them that love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose, for whom he did foreknow. He also did foreordain or predestinate that we be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. And then I close with Second Timothy chapter two and verse twelve. Second Timothy chapter two and verse twelve. You might just jot it down if you don't get turned there. 2 Timothy 2.12, 
Paul and given the qualifications of the pastor teacher to Timothy, who would then pass that information on to others. <laughs> thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. The things that thou hast heard from me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No man that wars entangles himself with the affairs of this life that he may please him who has chosen him to be a soldier. If I'm a soldier, which I was, uh, I couldn't be also signed up to work at Walmart on the weekend. I was on call all the time. Any of you that's been in the military understand that. And if a man also strive for the masteries, that is to earn the crowns, this is striving for the Olympic Games. Yet he is not crowned except what? He strive according to the rules. I don't care how fantastic some churches or some believers may be, but if you're not living according to God's divine mandates in your life, and God, only God knows that, for any of us, you can shoot the ball and make a shot from one end of the court down to the other. But number one, if you're not on a team, it doesn't count. If you're not saved, it doesn't count. And number two, if you're not in bounds and the coach hasn't put you in, it doesn't count. If you shoot the ball from out of bounds, it doesn't count. If you catch the ball out of bounds at football, it doesn't count. And God's not going to move the goal around just to please you. And that's the kind of society that we live in today is that we have the idea not only with among people in society of everybody having their own little specific groups to join up into, that we also have the same idea in churches or in the moral center of America that we can just do that whichever suits us because God, God's... Law of right and wrong is different for me than it is for you. No, it's not. If also a man strive for the masteries, that is, he's trying for the Olympics to get that crown in whatever event that is, he is not crowned unless he strives lawfully, according to the rules. And then, verse 12, if we suffer, if we suffer, endure undeserved suffering because of our Christian life, we shall also Reign with Him. Reign with Him. In other words, the context is there's, there's blessings for faithful service. What, at whatever level. You don't have to be the preacher or the teacher or singer or nothing. But faithful to God. There is blessing for faithful service. And don't let anybody rob you of that. Now, I have said that on many occasions. There's times when you have to fight for that. And some Christians don't understand the concept and they just give in to get along with anything. If you don't fight for it, you're not going to get it. Don't let somebody rob it from you. Don't let somebody pull you away from Bible doctrine and tell you that we're going to go down an emotional highway and it's going to be all good. It's going to be great. We're going to enjoy this now. We won't have to study as much. You're going to become a dumber than a bag of hammers, spiritually speaking, if you do. I'm telling you this to help you get ready for the judgment seat of Christ. We have a Christianity that has not grown up, but grown apart. And we need the Word of God to unify the body of Christ. And God needs voices that will do that. And I'm just one of thousands. Hopefully tens of thousands, but I don't know. We don't have a club where we talk to one another. <laughs> we just... Get after it. If we suffer, we shall also reign with Him. Okay? It doesn't necessarily mean that you're a martyr or you died for it or you went to jail for it. But you did take public scorn because of it. You did take scorn from your family because of it. Maybe your boyfriend or your girlfriend or your spouse or your co-worker. Or maybe even worse. But if we deny Him, He will also deny us. Hello. Let's get this squared away. He's not talking about salvation. He's talking about reward. He will deny us reward if we deny Him access to use us for His glory as He sees fit. If we deny Him, He will also deny us. If we believe not, that is, we're 
apistos, unfaithful. That's what that word in the Greek is there. If we are unfaithful, yet he abideth faithful, for he cannot deny himself. Phew, at least I'm going to be saved. Yeah, but you're going to be a dead gum pauper forever. I know you're not going to have a sin nature in heaven, so it's not going to matter whether you're in a little cabin in the woods with old puppy poo or whatever. (laughs) Whatever your dream of heaven is. But let the Lord take care of that. Don't worry about the mule. Just load the wagon. It will take care of itself. But the spoils of Christ's victory at the cross... Yes, we all have a general inheritance, but there are also specific inheritances that you will be shocked when you get there. So will I. These are more than children. These are more than children. They are faithful adult sons, as it were. And I will, Revelation 21, 7, He that overcometh shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. The word son is not technon or padeon, but huios, which means mature men and women, boys and girls in the things of God. You don't have to be an old man or old woman to be mature in Christ. Do I worship God with my mind, my motivations, my time, my giving, my gifts and talents? After all, I expect to reap a reward, so I must not sow sparingly. There are an awful lot of people who want a great uh, they, they, ex- they expect a little effort to give them a great crop. And in other words, if you if you plant uh, two tomato plants and or whatever, you're only going to get what two tomato plants can produce. You're not going to get what eight or ten or whatever it will produce. You and I both know that. Do the best that you can with what you've got, but always be looking for opportunity. We know that all born-again believers will go to heaven because they've received eternal life and forgiveness of sin, but only those who allow God to conform them to the image of Christ through the changing of their life will qualify to be the mature adult children of God who qualify for some of these divine rewards that God has the prerogative to give out, and He wants to. Don't think, think about it. It's not that God is, is stingy, because He's not stingy, but the justice of God cannot reward what the righteousness of God cannot give. And we need to understand that concept. God is not a sentimentalist. We need to understand that about the character of God. God is not a sentimentalist. Yes, God does show mercy. God does love. But God is not a sentimentalist. And He's not going to be pushed over. And He's not going to be bribed. We have to have a consummate respect for God that we have for no human being on this earth to understand the ramifications of who we're dealing with. And Christianity has forgot who it's dealing with. And I'm going to tell you, the more respect you have for God, the happier a Christian you are. A disrespectful Christian is a miserable Christian. Various ministries that you and I can be involved with do add flavor. They do add spice to our life and to our church. But if we are not getting sound exposition from the Scripture to inform us and conform us to Christ, then we're not going to be changed nor qualify for these exceeding riches of Christ in time or in eternity. Having a nice personality and a wonderful emotional effervescence Demonstrating marvelous talent does not qualify you for reward. There are some believers who are foolish enough to think that if they cut a record or do something or whatever or speak at some some function somewhere, that somehow or another, wow, God must be impressed with me. Uh, don't think so. Because <laughs> there are unsaved people who have the exact same traits. <laughs> Many of God's people have been duped by religious crackpots and charlatans who had a nice personality and great talent. And many unsaved people, though, have been turned off from Christianity because of the bad experiences they had with such alleged saints of God. So true. So Christ said in John 4.23, as we close for the third time, three strikes and I'm out, that the Father seeks out those who will worship Him in spirit and in truth, not those who worship Him in flesh and emotion. God is too wonderful 
And heaven is too glorious for the pastor or his people to waste time feeding on the things that do not translate into eternal glory. I say amen to that. That's just my take on what I see. All right. Let's pray. Good seeing you all this week. And I hope you have a good, safe week. I'll tell you that now because it takes about 30 seconds for this little dial to go around on my phone before I can hit finish. And once I hit finish on it, then it asks me another question because it starts playing it back to me. And so I have to wait for it to pop up to save or to erase. So I have to hit all those buttons before I can even say, I hope you all have a good week, so I'm saying it now. I just want y'all to know why I'm fiddling with this phone when it's over because I still got stuff I got to do before I can wrap this up. Before I can, so I just told everybody else what I'm doing there too. That's fine. It is what it is. This is not any great big broadcast here, but hopefully it helps us. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your love and your care for us. Thank you for your mercy not giving us what we might have coming to us or do have coming to us at times. We thank you for your grace where you give to us what we really don't deserve. And we thank you for all the all the great blessings that you have for us in time. And may we not look past them and not look past present opportunities to honor you with our words to encourage somebody else or to do for others what we are capable of doing, whether it's large or small. We thank you, Heavenly Father, that you prepare us in our mind for who it is that we're going to meet with you and your son. That you prepare us for the for the loving, correct, righteous, pure judge that our Savior is. But that he has to judge to give reward. And we thank you that he is just, that he is fair, that he wants what is best for us, help us to understand that as we go forward. We've all made mistakes in the past, but we realize, Heavenly Father, that they don't define us. We want to be defined in Christ. We want to be defined in the body of Christ. We want to be defined as children of God. And so we put our faith in Jesus Christ, our Savior, to save us from our sins for all eternity and to infuse us with your word and to indwell us with your spirit. We ask that you would use the word and your spirit to mighty to do mighty things through even the simplest of us people for your glory and for our good. In Jesus Christ's name we pray and we give thanks. Amen.